Okay, we are live. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On today's show, I have a very special guest. He comes to us from the UK. His name is Henry Hemming. His last name is spelled H-E-M-M-I-N-G. And I had him on a couple of years ago, 2021, to talk about a book I was interested in because of its title, Alistair Crowley. The title of that book is Agent M, The Lives and Spies of MI5's Maxwell Knight. I highly suggest people check that out. But I just came to my attention that he published a new book. If you're watching this on X or YouTube or Rockfin, you'll see a title of the book and the, the cover of the book. And it just it was published April 2nd, 2024. And the full title is Four Shots in the Night, A True Story of Spies, Murder, and Justice in Northern Ireland. And I was listening, this is kind of the first time I've really listened through an audiobook. I was uh, delighted to get a copy of that audiobook and listen to it. It's really good. It's very dramatic and it has a lot of different accents and involvement. It's much uh, more interesting than some of the other audiobooks I've listened to. So congrats on that. But this is not his first book. And he has written for The Economist, FT Magazine, Washington Post. And his books have been featured in The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Christian Science, Science Monitor. And if you're seeing this uh, through what's live like the even the new york times commented on the book and daily express compared him uh delivers a read worthy of lucari himself so i think that's a very high compliment and it is a really interesting story maybe americans don't know that much about this the troubles in northern ireland really kind of a longer term conflict arguably goes back centuries but um, flared up in the 70s and 80s but like i said i just want to read out some of his other books for people one is in search of the english eccentric misadventure in the middle east the ingenious mr pike agents of influence influence a british campaign a canadian spy and a secret plot to bring america into world war ii that's in 2019 so you can check that out but again his website is his full name henry hemming and we're going to talk about four shots in the night uh, but it is an interesting story, really. There's a lot of intrigue, and it's almost kind of like Casablanca or something like that. A lot of real interesting conflict, but he can talk more about that. So Henry Hemming, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's um, really, really good to be back. It's been a few Absolutely. years. Yeah, yeah, it's been too long. So for yeah. people who may not have heard of our earlier show about Maxwell, your book about Maxwell Knight, maybe you can talk about your background and your books and what led you up to the research and publication of Four Shots in the Night. Yeah, my, my background is uh, writing about spies, writing about intelligence, about espionage. But to be honest, this, uh, this new book is, it's a departure, it's different. It's different to other things that I've written in the past. And up until now, I've, I've concentrated really on, on Second World War spies. And there's a conversation that I had about five, six years ago. And it was with someone who, who knew a great deal about intelligence studies and, and espionage and, and the inner life of spies. And he said to me something like, you do realize the biggest story in the history of British intelligence over the last 70 years is one that's hardly been told. And of course, I was, I was gripped, I was intrigued. And he went on to say that this story was the story of spies inside the IRA in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and the role that they played in bringing this conflict to an end. So that was my way into this. And yes, it's not my specialist subject, Northern Ireland and the Troubles, um, but I decided to um, to have a go, to, to throw myself into the subject and uh, and do my best to to research it to understand it and that began this extraordinary journey if you like of uh, research in the archives and, and libraries but also crucially and this is what really set this whole experience apart for me meeting people who had experience of uh, of being in the region and operating during the troubles and and talking to them about their stories so people from the ira people who grew up in Northern Ireland, had lived there, knew the people I, I was writing about, and then also people who'd been working for the British. And to begin with, it was it was just, I, I was intrigued by the whole subject, you know, spies in Northern Ireland. Who were they? How many of them were there? What were they doing? But everything changed for me when I heard about one particular spy, and this is a man called Frank Hegarty. And this is when the whole outline of, of a book began to appear in my mind. And it became, in some ways, a, a true crime story. 
What I heard about Frank Haggerty was this, that he was a British spy. He had been killed in 1986. And the rumor was that he might have been killed by another British spy. So someone who had uh, infiltrated the IRA just like him, but had been given the order by the IRA to take this man's life. And that was the moment I thought, right, this is, this is something I want to investigate. This is something I want to know more about. And, uh, and so that's really where the, the, where the kind of genesis of this book lay. And what's the kind of conflict for people who don't know the troubles at the intro of this book, you kind of go into it. There's a lot of murders or bombings. There's a, you know, Ireland, the IRA wants all of what all 12 principalities in Ireland to become one. Right. So that's, one big republic and then there's the northern island which is really governed by the uk right yeah absolutely you've got the, the six there. counties in the northern Ireland. i guess um maybe the best way to think of the troubles is to, is to think of these three really distinct ingredients and um and a lot of people think it's the troubles is about just one thing it's just about let's say unification northern Ireland becoming part of the republic of ireland but really, it's, I think it's more accurate to think of it as in these three different ways. It begins as something else. It begins as a civil rights campaign. And it begins really on, on the streets of Derry. And what you have are mostly Catholics, but also Protestants marching in the streets. And they're asking very simply, not for unification, but for equal rights for both Catholics and Protestants living in Northern Ireland. So they want equal rights. They're, hugely inspired by what's been happening in America. So it's the civil rights campaigning there, which um, which inspires people in Northern Ireland. And as this campaign begins to, to gather steam and momentum, there's a reaction. There's a reaction, and it comes mostly from people within the Protestant community in Northern Ireland. So here you've got the second element of this, this conflict, and that is this, this sectarian conflict that begins to develop. And Put really simply, it's it's Protestants, including many of those in the police, in conflict against Catholics in the region who begin to see that this is the chance they have to get equal rights and to, to win some of the power that they've been denied historically for so many years. And the third ingredient is the one that comes about after some of the sectarian violence begins to get out of control. And that is the British army arrives in the region and begins to patrol on the streets. And very soon after that happens, about three or four months after that, there begins to be this uh, this campaign against them, this counterinsurgency. And you then got this third ingredient. So you've got a counterinsurgency, you've got a sectarian conflict, and you've got a civil rights campaign. And mixed together, you've got the troubles. Right. And that was it's very unusual for the British army to be deployed like that. Right. I think that's correct. Right? Totally. It's, um, it's something that, that very rarely happens in, in British history. And the reason is pretty obvious. They're not this is not their their jam. They're not trained to be uh, patrolling British streets and they don't know what to do. They're not trained as a police force. And and so the British government at the time is, is deeply conflicted about this. Should we send soldiers onto the streets in Northern Ireland? Is this a mistake? Where is it going to lead? Nobody quite knows. But they do know that the situation is beginning to spiral out of control and that the police in Northern Ireland are not able to, to cope with what's going on. So they make this decision. They decide it's probably in the best interest of everyone there to send in the soldiers. And what's interesting is that to begin with, it seems to be working. So for the first three, four months, the violence abates, there are fewer casualties, and there seems to be the beginning of some kind of peaceful resolution to what's been going on. But then after about four months in, in early 1970, things begin to begin to change. Right, and so then there's the conflict, the bombings, and there's also kind of the spy warfare, like. The view of the, from what I took from the book, is that the view of the, from London, was that intelligence was going to win the, the, eventually win the conflict. Is that right? Can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, well, the, the interesting thing is it took them about 10 years to, to come to that conclusion. And uh, for the first 10 years of the conflict, they thought it's just, it's about tougher policing. It's about more soldiers. 
It's about everything apart from intelligence. And of course, there was an intelligence operation early on in the travels. But it's only about 10 years into this conflict that there is this fundamental change. And there are people high up in the army who decide, actually, let's see what we can do making intelligence the priority. And so there begin to be more spies. The army takes on more spies. The MI5 presence in the region begins to grow. There's even a, a special uh, former head of MI6 who's sent over just to oversee this new intelligence operation. And, you know, just, just for a moment, taking a step back, this is new. This has never been tried before. There's never been an attempt like this to try and end a conflict using spies on this kind of scale. And just to, to fast forward for a moment to later on in the conflict, I just want to give you a sense of the, the size of this operation, because it's one that is um, astonishing, I think. There was um, somebody called Father Dennis Bradley, who in, I think it was, uh, it was, it was suddenly in the 21st century, he was, um, he was given access to classified government documents. And he was allowed to see intelligence, which, which gave an idea of just how many agents there were operating in the region. And we've all heard of, let's say, the Cambridge Five. We've, um, and I remember sort of hearing this, this, this interview and thinking the numbers can be maybe 10 or 20. And he said there were 800 secret agents operating in Northern Ireland at any one time during the Troubles. And some people think that figure is, even that is an underestimate. So you've got this, it, it's, 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 yeah, the scale of it is unusual. And because it's never been tried before, there are things that almost inevitably go wrong. There are things which aren't expected. And, you know, to get to the kind of the nub of the, the story that I'm telling in, in four shots in the night, the things that go wrong are when you have too much intelligence. And as a spy master or an agent handler, you have to decide which intelligence to ignore and which intelligence to act upon. And sometimes the people running these agents were, were left to these incredibly difficult decisions where they realized if they acted on the intelligence they were getting, they might endanger the life of the person who'd given it to them. But also by not acting on it, they could endanger someone's life because they'd be the victim of an attack. And this is where it becomes morally really complex and difficult. And if there's one thing that became really clear from, from the research that I did, it's that a lot of the a lot of the men and women who are running these agents didn't always have the adequate training or a sense of the legal guidelines that they need to be following when they were faced with these impossibly difficult life or death decisions. So the scale of this operation is huge. The moral dilemmas are incredibly difficult. And at the same time, many historians are beginning to, uh, to concur that one of the reasons the troubles ended when they did was that there were so many spies in operation at that time. And this was making it harder for the IRA to function in the way that they wanted to. And this probably played a part in ending the troubles. And maybe you can talk about the IRA, the importance of the IRA and some of their, from their mm. maybe standpoint, their successes, like they killed blew up the Earl of Mountbatten, I think a northeastern, off the coast of northeastern Ireland. Maybe you can talk about them. Yeah. So the the IRA, absolutely. I mean, you, 1979 is when um, the IRA killed Lord Louis Mountbatten, a um, member of the royal family. And uh, and what's interesting is that on the same day, there was another attack that they that they undertook, which um, which killed a series of soldiers at um, a place called Warren Point. And in some ways that had even more of an effect. I mean, yes, the headlines were, were all about Mountbatten, but in terms of the effect on the army, the effect on the British government and the, their way of thinking about it all, the, the actual, the Warren Point attack had more of an impact. So by this point, what is the IRA? The IRA is a paramilitary organization. It's, um, it's made up of, uh, by this point, it's, it's been in its latest incarnation. It's been going for about 10 years. And most of the people inside it by that stage are survivors. They are good at what they do. They are security conscious. They're extremely hard to track down. They are absolutely dedicated to their cause. And their cause is to try and, by, by military means, remove 
the British army from Northern Ireland, to try and defeat the British army. That's that's the goal. And it's been the goal since pretty much the start of the Troubles. But the one thing that's changed for those inside the IRA by this point is they're beginning to, to adopt a strategy called the long war strategy. So they're no longer thinking, right, we're going to win in the next couple of months, or we're going to win by the end of this year. They're beginning to think, actually, if we can just stick in there, we can just keep going for many years. There'll come a point where the Brits are forced to negotiate with us and we can have some kind of political compromise, some kind of political solution. Maybe that's the way to get a result. So around about that time, there is this, this fundamental shift deep inside the IRA where they begin to, uh, to, to have a different attitude towards what's going on. Right. And didn't, wasn't there an attack by the IRA on uh, 10 Downing too? Like they did very audacious. Uh, there was. Yeah. Absolutely. There was, um, I mean, look, just to name two um, extremely well-known attacks. One was, um, was an attempt to take the life of Margaret Thatcher. That was uh, in 1984. And uh, and that was the that was sound in Brighton. That was uh, they knew that the Tory Party was having its its annual conference, and a bomb was planted in the toilet, or rather behind the toilet, the room in which she was staying, or and uh, or very nearby. I don't know the exact details. And the bomb went off successfully. It um, it killed five people, but it did not kill the main target, i.e. Thatcher. And then less than a decade later. The IRA managed to fire mortars at 10 Downing Street and again came incredibly close to um, to assassinating a, a British prime minister. So, yeah, the IRA was was audacious. It was an extremely um, competent and successful organization in terms of its ability to to deliver these high profile attacks, but also so many attacks inside Northern Ireland and um and these were aimed at all sorts of different targets, whether it was whether it was British soldiers, whether it was local police, or on many occasions it was just local Protestants or anyone who was uh, believed to have some kind of connection to the British state. I mean, one of the stories I remember writing about in, when I was writing Four Shots in the Night is a story of someone called Joanne Mathers, and she was um, a young mother who, um, to earn some extra money, was going door to door collecting information for the uh, the British census, and this I mean I don't actually know if you have this in America. This is uh, this uh, happens once every ten years where you, all information about people living all over the country is gathered on uh, on one particular day. And she we have kind of a this. census. I don't know if that uh, we have a ten year census. Yeah, it's um. Does it involve people going door to door gathering information or anything like that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, we go door to door here. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how much of it, how detailed of information it is. Is, yeah. is yours detailed? It's it's fairly detailed. Um, and anyway, this this um, this young mum was uh, was taking part in this. But for some members of the IRA, even taking part in that was seen as collaborating with the enemy. So word got out that she was going door to door and um, the order came down to um, to have her killed. So she was um, she was murdered, and that actually one of the last people to see her alive was someone who was so affected by what happened that he then decided to um, begin to work for the British as an undercover agent, and uh, and it's one of these fascinating stories. He then becomes an important figure within Sinn Fein. He passes on crucial information, and he also plays a, a small part in this um, in the story that unfolds in uh, in Four Shots in the Night. Which what was that? Was that uh, Scapatici? Was that him, or was it somebody else? It's actually it's a guy called Willie Carlin, okay. and Willie Carlin. His um, but his life was saved later on by Freddie Scapatici. Gotcha. So, so Freddie he Scapatici, kind of, yeah. he's uh, the guy who's. I mean, some of your listeners may know him as uh, State Knife, who's uh, been in the news recently. Oh, can you talk about that recent news and kind of about Scapatici? He's kind of an interesting yeah. character. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Freddie Scapatici, he's um, he is a Belfast bricklayer. He's he's recruited by the British Army. He becomes an agent in the late 1970s, and he's asked to join the IRA. Now he was previously a part of the IRA, but he got kicked out. So after he's recruited by the British, he agrees to to try and get back inside the organisation, 
and um and he does this and then soon after he gets inside the ira he's um he's asked to join this one particular unit inside the ira and it's called the nutting squad or its, it's official title is the internal security unit and this unit is the part of the ira devoted to hunting down spies so what they do is they interrogate people in the ira who are suspected of, of being a spy and then if the order comes from up on high from the likes of mcginnis for that person to be to be shot to be killed then the nutting squad is uh, most likely to do it and freddy scapatici is uh, at one point he's given the instruction he's told right we found a spy he's called willie carlin he's over in derry you need to go with the nutting squad you need to go and abduct him you need to go and interrogate him and they will make a decision on, on on what happens to him and what he does is rather than go straight away he um he delays and he immediately makes a call to his handler and he tells his handler look they're after this man willie carlin i think you need to uh, to let him know you need to get him out of there as soon as possible and that's what happens and the message is passed on willie carlin gets a call from his handler and he's told look you've got maybe 12 hours to get out of your house. You need your family out of there as soon as possible. So that's what they do. Willie Carlin and his family pack all their things. They're removed from Northern Ireland. They start a new life in, in witness protection. And then when Scapatici and the Nutting Squad arrive, they find, of course, that the house is empty and um, and all of the other people in his unit are, are furious. So Scapatici, he's, um, he's an interesting and uh, a notorious character. So he's part of this unit. It's believed that he took part in 14 murders. Wow. wow. 14 murders, which is an astonishing, astonishing number. And there was a police investigation which began quite recently, began in 2016, called Operation Canova. And this was centered purely on Scapatici. What does Scapatici do? Did he commit murders while he was acting as a spy? Did his handlers know about this? Did they turn a blind eye? Were they right to do so from a from a legal point of view, from a moral point of view? And this police investigation just last month delivered its first, what was called its interim report. And that begins to describe some of its findings. And although it hasn't given us any detail on exactly which murders Scapatici may or may not have been involved in, the overall conclusion of this report is that Scapatici probably took more lives than he is responsible for saving and the mistakes wow. almost certainly were made so he's um that's why he's in the news but it's a very murky environment like there were certain things like i remember listening to a story of a british officer going to a bar and they sussed out that his accent was just a little off and then he disappeared like you could literally get disappeared out of a bar in the wrong place at the wrong time at the, in those in that environment i mean and this mcginnis guy like it's interesting because the troubles took place but it didn't happen in a historical vacuum right like you write about Absolutely. his influence by michael collins and michael collins kind of ruthlessness uh, as mm. well can you talk about that yeah and it's um I mean, it's so important you know when when does the troubles begin it you could say it begins back in the in the 17th century it's um or even before that but it's it has a yeah it's a huge mistake to see it in some kind of historical vacuum. And for Martin McGuinness, I guess one of the kind of early references for him is, is what happened earlier in the 20th century with Michael Collins and his campaign against the British during the, uh, the, the Irish War of Independence. And Michael Collins is this brilliant, charismatic IRA leader. And he's the person who's in charge of intelligence for the IRA during his campaign, his counterinsurgency campaign against the, the British Army. And one of the things he does, which really sets him apart, is he has this absolute zero tolerance policy towards spies. He sets up a unit, it's called the squad, and it's devoted to not just tracking down spies, but then killing them. And um, it's believed to have killed hundreds of, um, of people, not all of them were spies. And this had an effect, this had a, a huge impact on, on people's willingness to, to work for the British, to supply information. And Martin McGuinness, in the late 1970s, he's, um, he knows that the IRA has, has a problem with spies. They've got to do something. And it's pretty clear that he's, he's inspired by Michael Collins when he decides to set up this, this new unit called the Nutting Squad. 
and uh, he, he makes the decision to be as ruthless as Michael Collins was. And he, he very much admired and wanted to emulate parts of uh, Michael Collins's career. So that, yeah, the history certainly informs what's going on in the travels. Right. And he, I mean, there was another guy from Sinn Féin that he was friends with too, right? Was it where they go on walks together? I remember hearing that, like they were, their operational security was very important, right? Yeah. Face to face, like almost like a mob, like face to face contact, no bugs or anything, right? Exactly. And, um, and I think you're talking about Jerry, Jerry Adams. Jerry Adams. And, yeah. uh, and so, so yeah, Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams say, uh, there's an amazing, podcast interview that I heard, uh, the pair of them talking about this, talking in some quite bleak terms about this period in their life when they both went away for these long walks and quite often would go um, for long walks out of Derry. It would start at, a, at the house of Martin McGuinness's mother and then walk up to this ancient hilltop fort overlooking this incredible panorama over parts of Ireland and I've been there it's, it's a fantastic place to be it's uh, hugely inspiring and while they're up there they were trying to figure out what do we do how do we what direction do we take the IRA how are we going to make it uh, free from spies and that's really where the genesis of the nutting squad lies those those long walks that they took through the kind of the damp northern Irish countryside and when I was writing Four Shots in the Night, that was a, that was a really interesting moment, being able to, to, to visualize those walks and to understand what they were seeing as they were trying to, uh, to make these incredibly difficult decisions and trying to work out the future of the, of the organization. It must have been an incredible moment, too, because they're making these like earth shattering decisions for Ireland in the context of like this place, this famous castle that was mentioned by Ptolemy. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it's like this is like the we're really in an Irish environment making these yeah. decisions for the for the nation state. It's really something else. The um, but also there was a lot of jailings, and I remember there's allegations of like torture in British jails and things like that that were also part of this whole environment in Northern Ireland. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. There. Um, so early on in the troubles, uh, the British Army makes quite a few mistakes and like really big mistakes like tragedies occur you've got bloody sunday you've got the um you're referring to the the hooded men yeah. uh, incident yeah. where where men um innocent men as in they'd not been charged hadn't been prosecuted for anything were taken they were, their heads were, were covered with hoods and they were subjected to various forms of torture and this was in order to try and extract information and and this is yeah this is part of this this really kind of like gung ho over the top reaction to what's happening from the British Army in those early days of the troubles, and in the years that follow, they realise this is this is absolutely not working. We have to to change our tactics, change our approach. We need to uh, to have a completely different stance when it comes to how we're going to be in Northern Ireland. So um, yeah, there were those. Um, some horrific incidents early on in the troubles. And, and yeah, a lot of the time, these were British soldiers and commanders who'd been, um, they were using tactics, which they'd been using in places around the British Empire as it was falling apart and as, as the national independence movements were, were beginning to, to gain momentum. And they were just applying some of these tactics or adapting them for use in Northern Ireland, for use within the United Kingdom. And uh, yeah, it didn't work. It led to some uh, some really unpleasant episodes. But that was kind of like what the IRA and the kind of uh, patri the Irish patriots were kind of based on is that the the UK Empire was giving up some some of its global property. So maybe they thought this yes. was their chance, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the and and it was so interesting for me going through the the government documents from the seventies and the eighties. And you begin to understand there that there's there's not within the British government this really sort of patriotic, passionate desire to to hang on to Northern Ireland. It's not a it's not a question of principle so much as demographics. In other words, what makes Northern Ireland completely different from, let's say, I don't know, Kenya, is that the majority of people in Northern Ireland want to remain part of the United Kingdom. And that completely changes the situation. So it's not a, a colonial possession, which the British government can just give up. 
And I think in terms of national self-determination, that's what, what makes this, this, this particular region so different. And, um, and yeah, I think to begin with, there are people in the IRA who think this is the moment. Um, perhaps they'll forget about the demographics. Perhaps the government will just say, okay, we've given up so much other territory around the world. Let's do the same in Northern Ireland. But about 10 years in, it becomes really clear to certainly the likes of McGuinness and Adams that that is not about to happen, that the Northern Ireland is not seen as a, a colonial possession and that they need a, a, a different approach. Gotcha. And can you talk about, I mean, there's all these different operations. I mean, it's really like if you're studying intelligence and uh, things like that, conflict, there's just so many different things, different operations, different mm, techniques mm. trying to be applied mm. to hang on to. Can you talk about like Operation Chiffon or something else like that? Yeah, sure. This is, um, so this comes uh, later on in the book. And uh, I mean, at the heart of this book is, is a question of who killed Frank Hegarty, who is this British agent that I've, that I've focused on. And there's this fascinating episode where um, one of the people who's, who's suspected of having given the order is none other than Martin McGuinness. Martin McGuinness, who is uh, also a Sinn Féin leader. He later becomes Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. Anyway, he's, he's one of the people who's suspected of having ordered this particular killing. But the British also know that Martin McGuinness could be the key to bringing peace to the region. And he's someone who can bring parts of the IRA with him. He can persuade some of these really hardline militants to come with him and to push for a political compromise. Jerry Adams, not so much, that he doesn't quite have the trust of some of those hardliners. So the British know that Martin McGuinness is, is important. And Operation Chiffon begins after um, a conversation between someone working for MI6 and Martin McGuinness. And, uh, and, I, and I love the story of how it came about. Maybe I'll, I'll, save, I'll save for the book the details of what happens, but it's, it's an unexpected encounter. It's been engineered by a very close friend of this MI6, this, this British intelligence officer. And technically, this MI6 guy, when he finds himself in the same room as Martin McGuinness, who is at that time considered to be an IRA leader, someone that the British should not be speaking to, Technically, this MI6 officer should have just left the building straight away. So sort of just said, I, I can't speak to you. This is my government's policy. I'm out of here. But he doesn't. It stays put. They talk. They continue to talk. And then three hours later, they're still talking. And this conversation is the beginning, really, of the peace process. And it's, it's the beginning of something called Operation Chiffon, which is this undercover operation to try and bring about the start of a, of a peace process to, to achieve a ceasefire in Northern Ireland from the IRA. And, uh, and it all comes about really because of a friendship, a friendship between Martin McGuinness and, uh, and, and someone who knows an MI6 officer. But there then comes a point where the police in Northern Ireland, they've got enough information to put together a case against Martin McGuinness. So they think he's probably responsible for ordering the death of this man, Frank Hegarty. And they think they've got enough evidence that they want to press charges. However, MI5 are left with this incredibly difficult decision of do we allow this prosecution to go ahead or do we say, no, he has to be out of jail so the peace process can stand a chance of, uh, of continuing. What's remarkable is that these guys are still around. Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams and some of these other characters who were involved in the troubles became kind of legitimized politicians. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, Martin McGuinness obviously is is dead, but Jerry oh, Adams is, died, is very much, he's, uh, Jerry Adams is still around. And, oh, he died uh, in 2017, sorry. Still... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. It's, um, it is, it's fascinating that so many of the characters in this story, in this period of history, they are still around. And some of them are beginning to talk about what happened. Some of them, not so much. And Jerry Adams is certainly someone who, who, let's just say it's not opened up fully about his past. I can imagine, I can see why. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, went wrong. If there's five, it was 5,000 people that died overall. There was massive amount of like emotional damage, PTSD, 
scarred mm. people from the conflict, right? Like there were the consequences were yeah, almost. about three and a half thousand people who who died during the conflict and tens of thousands who were injured. And I, I think one of the saddest statistics I've heard is is that more people took their own lives in the twenty years after the troubles than were killed during the conflict itself. So there are deep, not just physical wounds, but also psychological wounds, which um, which many people have had to carry. And and look, the I think the one thing that so many people I've spoken to have have, have agreed upon is that for, for many people, the, the best way forward is to have a better understanding of what really happened, to have a, a clearer sense of the, the truth and to, to get away from this, this culture of, of trying to hide everything, trying to cover everything up and trying to uh, just to bury the past. So there is more information coming out. I think that's a good thing. And I really hope Four Shots in the Night can be, can be a small part of that. Interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting story. Not a lot of Americans know about it, but we see little pieces of it from music, U2, or uh, hear stories or little, but this is some a book that encapsulates all that. And we are at the 36 minute mark. I mean, where is there anything you'd like to add or anything I missed? And where can people find the book? I think um, I think we, we've we've given a good intro to the book. It's uh, they can find it on I mean the usual suspects Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you name it. Bookshop.org, they're good, and uh, it's an audio book as you were saying earlier. It's it's an ebook, and uh, and yeah, it's it's available as of now. Nice, congratulations! And it's a really interesting audio book. It's different than other ones. It's almost like uh, obviously a professional voice actor but you have yeah. if he it has a feel of an irish feel and you have irish accents in there so congrats on that Thank and you. Uh, the best place to reach you also and look at your other books or find your other books is your website is that correct that's correct yeah that's absolutely right. henry hemming.com right last name is spelled h-e-m-m-i-n-g so it's henry hemming all one word dot com and again today we talked about in kind of an introduction to the book there's a lot more information many more chapters full title of the book is four shots in the night a true story of spies murder and justice in northern ireland ireland just published in april 2024 and the author again is henry hemming thanks so much for your time appreciate it thanks so much it's been really good to be on the show yeah cool